Um, thank you, Void. Thank you, Kavarna Max, Pixel Point, and Axioma for um, giving me this opportunity to express myself. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about expressivity as a condition for expression and I kind of made this up so I'll try to explain what I mean by that. Uh, let's say that we can divide conditions for expression into a formal uh, and a material aspect. Roughly the material is about having something to say at all and the formal is a kind of part of a limit of expressible expressions. So it's not directly about freedom of expression as in being censored or not being heard. Uh, it's also not about communication uh, and interpretation as in being understood and receiving an expression in different ways. So expressivity deals with questions relating to what is or is not expressible in a given system. So this is quite tricky when it comes to natural language, which is the one we usually speak, um, in which uh, we like me talking now, for example. Uh, so today I'll go through a couple of episodes in different systems so that we can maybe get a better idea about expressivity and perhaps its future. Um, so the motivation for looking at the history of expressivity in this way, for example, is looking for moments where uh, expressivity increased uh, when something was proven about expressivity of a system, um, stuff like that. And the reason why this is interesting is like to me is like at some point we reach a level where ex expressivity reached a limit and then it was overcame, uh, overcome and maybe uh, for some systems there's interesting proofs about the limits uh, of what they can express. Uh, and maybe then we can try to reason about the relation between changes in these systems and changes in expressivity of natural language itself, uh, if that's like a dream uh, we want to pursue. Uh, in fact, in particular, I like to look at the relationship between natural and formal languages. And the idea I like to use for this is uh, the explication of Rudolf Carnap. And this is a kind of diagram uh, of what that could look like. So the idea is we take an intuitive concept and then explicate it within a formal language with an appropriate interpretation. Um, so in contrast, maybe to compare to a more uh, familiar concept, people like to talk about terms like quantification and mostly it's in a critical register. And the story mostly goes like this. Uh, the richness of the intuitive concept is being reduced by quantification and something important is being lost. For a common example maybe is the story of IQ, where it's common to explain that the measure reduces the meaning of intelligence and leaves some important parts out. But I think there's more to the dynamics of meaning that can happen in this kind of situations and starting with um, Carnap, his own case is already uh, quite unique in this way. Uh, he developed this theory of explication in his book about uh, logical foundations of probability. And the situation there was the reverse of the IQ problem. Um, we have the mathematics of pro probability worked out. What was missing was a meaningful interpretation um, and it turns out there's more than one competing interpretation of probability. Um, so different meanings are related to probability and can be used to interpret probabilities. For example, we can count past occurrences and see about one sixth of dice throws uh, results in getting the number six. We can say that we believe with a degree one sixth that the next throw will return uh, Oh, once uh, in, in the sixth number. Uh, we can say that the physical system of a dice throw has the propensity to generate a sequence of results that will get a share of six, sixes that will be uh, one six. Um, so the probability maybe is not the best example for the questions I want to pose today, 
strictly because the completeness of the formalism there uh, was um, already way way worked out when the problems of interpretation came about. So today I would like to uh, look at the following topics. Um, uh, I would like to talk about how things played out in the areas of voting, markets, and computation, and we would look at then I would look at some models for how concepts themselves are modeled within some formal systems in in history, um, and then how these models are then reflected in something I could call maybe conceptual infrastructure. Uh, but first, maybe let's look at some even older ancient episodes in the history of expressivity, just so we kind of get an idea of what this means. So within mathematics, the square root of two um, is um, like a problem uh, that happens when we try to compute the length of the hypotenuse of the unit square, so square with uh, length one. Uh, and it's a kind of uh, scandalous history that at some point the proof appeared that this length cannot be expressed as a ratio of two natural numbers. And the Pythagoreans who discovered this proof had like a metaphysical belief that all numbers and all things in the world should be expressed as ratios of uh, natural numbers. Mm. So there was a kind of metaphysical backlash to to this uh, proof. But from, from the perspective of expressivity, we can see that a clear limit of the expressive powers of one formal system was reached. And from our perspective now, the obvious thing to do was to increase the allowable numbers uh, that the Pythagoreans didn't allow. Um, and this could be maybe called the real numbers like we call them today. Um, of course, it took mathematicians a long time to analyze this class of numbers, although some sophisticated definitions arose quite early, like Eudoxos basically gave a similar interpretation than uh, Dedekin would do in the like uh, 19th century, and he did it in the 4th century before Christ. Uh, the point, however, is that we have a single result about a single object that lies outside the bounds of a given formalism. If this object seems to be interesting to study, then maybe this encourages us to adapt the formalism. So another example maybe is a, like a riddles that were posed by um, Euclid for straight edge and compass constructions. Um, and here we have a like construction that uh, gives us a f pentagon, uh, so a regular polygon with uh, five uh, vertices. Um, so there the question is what can we express with these rules that uh, Euclid gave us? Um, and there's no particular metaphysical uh, weight maybe given to this because it seems kind of arbitrary why why should we just see what we can do with a ruler and a compass? Um, but again, we have a clear idea of what it means for a given system to be expressible in some way. Um, so maybe another older episode in exclusivity or a whole arc uh, in this series uh, is the development of the idea of acceleration. Um, and to simplify it extremely, um, in Aristotel Aristotelian physics, we posit only two kinds of motions being uniform and deformed motions of objects. So an object like a planet can move in circles, for example, and a stone can only move uniformly until it's deformed by some other object, like the ground or something like that. Mm. In this setup, then, it's hard to talk about various physical setups that have become essential for physical ideas. For example, pendulums uh, are kind of swinging, but they're obstructed, so they're deformed in, in this ontology of motion. Uh, and 
Orem was a like 13th century uh, scientist, uh, philosopher, who was thinking about this kind of problems that this kind of limited expressivity of uh, ontology of motion gives us uh, if we follow Aristotle. Um, so when he was trying to describe what we would later call accelerated motion, we see he awkwardly had to name these motions like uniform, uniformly deformed motion and deformly deformed motion. Uh, and the question maybe for expressivity is, is is that fine? Like, um, was was this a, a block like for for expressing ideas about uh, laws of physics, or or did he already had the correct idea and um, we just have a fancier term now calling it acceleration or uniform acceleration and so on. Mm. And this is then related to the question that later became big in philosophy, namely the question of infinitesimals. And in that episode, of course, many philosophers contributed as well. But from today's perspective, maybe these debates seem quite odd because now we have proofs that in certain formal systems you can have infin infinitesimals as members of a class and you call that class the hyperreal numbers and you can have a system with them or without and still do cal calculus. So. Um, it's it's weird to be dogmatic about it um, in in this kind of way, but it was still uh, a similar episode repeating through through this history where you have a suspicious kind of number, namely the infinitely small infinitesimal, and then a lot of people are reacting against it, like Berkeley calling them ghosts of the parted quantities. Um, and criticizing Newton for using them in, in his physics. Mm. So the pattern, I guess, here is a poorly understood formalism might also generate philosophical content um, that's maybe pretty good as philosophical content, but when we try to reconstruct these episodes, uh, I don't see the... A lot of the times these philosophical debates seem kind of a reaction to the problems of expressivity at the current stage of mathematical development, let's say. So if we go to voting now, um, so kind of stepping away from this higher mathematics. Um, so of course, it's a core concept for democracies and group decision making. And on the other, it appears like a simple counting problem. So in terms of the expressivity of our formal systems, there shouldn't be any problem. Um, mathematics should be enough to give expression to, to counting problems, right? Um, the issue with voting is that uh, what we are trying to express uh, is a counting problem, but the drama that unfolds there will be a kind of lack in the meaning of voting itself, and then we will be forced to fill it with a, with a new formalism. So maybe let's start with a familiar example and say that what a vote means is that it is counted as plus one to the one of the three parties that you kind of prefer. So the way I set up this counting problem, let's uh, suppose we have five seats that we want to fill. Suppose there are 1,000 voters, 500 vote for party A, 300 vote for party B and 200 for party C. Uh, so the first problem is how to represent the ratios of the votes into ratio of the seats so that it remains proportional. And again, this ghost of proportionality haunts us here again. Um, so if we divide the number of the votes with the seats, we get a kind of price of a seat uh, and we see that if we divide 1,000 by 5, we get a seat costing 200 votes. And then we notice that both A and B party are left with 100 votes extra, but that's not enough to buy a seat. Um, so the thing to notice here is this awkward situation that probably no analysis of meaning of voting or election 
will tell us what the correct next step is. Uh, it's as if the formalism itself demands further determination of the concept from outside the concept itself. Um, so we have to treat this um, as a step for decision to decide what voting should mean. So for example, we can treat this as a tie and say, okay, let's flip a coin and winner gets the seat. Uh, but in common use, we have this kind of method called uh, don't remainder. And so here we basically sort the quotients uh, we get from dividing the party's vote against an increasing divisor and the number of seats for each party um, is the greatest divisor in the sequence. So for example, party A gets the first seat because they have the most votes, B gets the second seat because 300 is more than 500 divided by two, and so on, and we get a deterministic procedure that says the seat should go to, the fifth seat should go to party A. Um, so we could move forward in the same manner, but luckily then we run out of seats and um, we're good. But the, the reason this and not some other option to reduce um, like to reduce our confusion about what voting means does not come from voting itself. So why, why would you choose this method? And the reason is kind of pragmatic, um, is that it reduces political fragmentation of um, elected parties. And that's, a, I guess, principle people agreed on that is good for working elected governments. Uh, but it's a hardly obvious conclusion from the meaning of voting itself. Um, so let's complicate matters a little more and maybe get a new interesting result about expressivity. Uh, let's introduce uh, rank votings and say that we have to divide, uh, decide between alternatives A, B and C. And the vote is no longer just your top pick, but you have to order the three that are available. Uh, so if you prefer A over B and B over C, you write this on your ballot and the vote will go in the first column uh, on the table. So let's consider this result from the elections. Uh, the numbers show that the numbers in the, in the first row um, show how many voters, voters voted for each configuration. So Voters A, uh, 30 voters think um, A is better than B and B is better than C. So just like you uh, in the previous example. And the, the other numbers are corresponding to the other ballots. Mm. So the question now becomes how should we count these votes to determine a winner? And there's actually plenty of ways to do it, but let's just look at two of them. Uh, the first is a Condorcet method, which compares all pairs and counts the wins. And then, so because A is above B in the first, second, and fifth row, uh, the columns we count, um, we count those columns together and we get 41, which is more than if we would do the same for B and we would get 40. Mm. So we say A defeats B and we do the same for A and C. We also see that A wins, and then we look at B and C and see that B wins. So A wins the tournament according to the Condorcet method. With board account, we turn the ranks, so first, second, third, into points, so that the third place gives you one point, the second gives you two, and the first gets you three points. And then you add them all together. But now we see that uh, two different methods give us two different winners. So again, it's not immediately clear which one should we choose based on the meaning of voting. Um, but there's practical reasons to talk about, um, again, when choosing one more voting method instead of the other. So for example, a uh, board account will favor uh, moderate outcomes and reduce extreme polarization while Condorcet method will usually give the true majority pref preference. 
but the downside of board account is that it enables strategic voting while Condorcet method can generate paradoxical cyclical situations where A defeats B and B defeats C and C defeats A again, so it's kind of a paradoxical tie. In fact, uh, Kenneth Arrow proved in uh, 1948 um, that no method of counting would satisfy the criteria he came up with, which are like normal semantic criteria for what it means to have a good voting system. So his work is probably first in the social sciences to make use of this kind of axiomatic method and pave the way to a new kind of thinking about optimal processes for uh, collective decision making. Uh, and of course, allocating scarce resources. Um, basically, it started the field of so-called mechanism design. Mm -hmm. So now I wanted to talk about the rules for Olympic decathlon, but maybe we can skip this. Um, the point is, you have 10 disciplines and you have to make a system that will give you a score so that we can rank participants in decathlon. So it's the same kind of a vibe of a problem, just that here it's a bit more complicated and even more arbitrary how we do it. And then you can discuss like if this scoring method um, unfairly like privileges uh, sprinters or something like that. Mm. So what conclusions should we make regarding the explication of voting? I mean, I think it's at least clear that there was a problem in the original concept of the vote and that when we're forced, forced to relax this criteria, uh, a kind of field of engineering or design opens up. And so now we move to markets. And a similar story unfolded in the concept of markets and auctions. Again, a highly central concept in society. Um, let's say it started when an economist realized that uh, the rules of an auction can give you different prices on a commodity. The classic examples are the English auction and the Dutch auction. So an English auction is the kind you see uh, in the movies. The auctioneer sets a price and the people raise their hand in order to make a higher bid. The bidding continues until no one makes a higher bid. These types of auctions are used to maximize revenue in competitive and high interest and low supply markets. On the other hand, in Dutch markets, uh, we start with a high price, so we set a high price and lower it until a buyer decides to accept the price and the commodity is sold at that point. So these kind of auctions are suited for high volume and time sensitive commodities like fruit, I think this is a fruit auction uh, in the image. Um, so if we move now to a more contemporary example of a market design, we can briefly look at the European electricity market, um, which is composed in, of many markets, but let's just take the main one. And it's called the day ahead market where suppliers bid their prices for every hour of the next day based on their production costs. So today they will make bids for every hour of tomorrow. And usually the way they make bids is how much money they spend to make the electricity, um, not how much money it takes to build the plant. Mm. So then the auctioneer sorts their bids and determines the point where demand is met. This is the kind of curvy line there. Um, and the operator then sets the price as the last highest price um, in, this, mm, in this sequence. Uh, the, the price of electricity is then set for all suppliers and this incentivizes low production cost suppliers because the difference between their production costs and the set price is like a bonus for them. So all the white space above up to the like dotted line um, is the bonus they get. And this is how EU tries to incentivize um, greener energy or whatever. Um, however, 
this idea can backfire since, for example, a sharp rise in gas prices um, can lead to market rewarding coal burning plants for electricity production, which is what happened after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, for example, US electricity uh, markets also use this kind of marginal pricing, but they do it on a state level, not like a federal level. And this then means lower integration of renewables and you don't see this kind of things as you see in the EU, for example, that if there's a low wind day in Germany, you can get a French nuclear power across the border quite easily. Um, Whereas in, in other places, they don't even have marginal pricing, but instead something like an average cost or a fixed rate. So what's the takeaway? Um, the, the further determinations of the concept of the market cannot be deduced from, from the market itself again. So some rule must be used, but the choice depends on exogenous factors and is then reevaluated pragmatically. So let's not get too caught up in the reality and go back to a former setting. Um, and we turn to a theory of computation, which gives us a kind of ideal example what a theory of expressivity can look like. So the way the theory is set up today is that we built formal machines which, which have increasing levels of expressivity. The expressive classes can uh, are determined by kinds of strings uh, that our machine can either accept or reject. Uh, and conveniently, uh, corresponding to these classes of formal machines is a hierarchy of classes of generators called languages or grammars, which produce the strings, um, the machines um, on the corresponding level or expressivity can accept. So. In the world of these generators and recognizers, in this setting, they align perfectly, while maybe in image generation today, they don't align anymore. But here, here it's a nice uh, setting for looking at this kind of expressive uh, powers. Um, we will look at the three levels and start with the finite state machine, um, which is a simple computer that can only track its current state and the response to ch characters it gets as input uh, one by one based on the state that it's in and the state changes like depending on what uh, character it reads. Um, so if at the end uh, of the input the machine is in an accept state, we say the machine accepted a string. So the accept state is the double circle one here, uh, Q2. Um, and the languages that correspond to this uh, are finite, finite state machines are called regular languages and they include strings that contain like simple patterns. Uh, so I don't know if we do the math on this one. Um, can you show it, uh, Tom? Yeah, um, we, would, we would get like a string, like for example, uh, 100 and then we would go one going from q1 to q2 and then zero going back to q1 and then zero going back to q1 and we would see how uh -huh, this string is not accepted and you can imagine how you could build things to match other strings so basically what this one means whatever the string is it should just end with one and you're good. Um, so it's a kind of simple pattern for accepting or rejecting strings. Um, but the moment we get something like a nested pattern, uh, like for example, I want a machine that makes, accepts only the strings that have the same numbers of zeros and ones, um, then we're we pose the problem that is outside of the expressibility of this kind of setup. And then we come to the next level of machines, which are push down automata. So they are similar to finite state machines, just that now we have a kind of memory, which is here named a stack, 
And when reading this string that we're reading, we can also add something on top of the memory or uh, and remember that, or remove the last element, but only the last. So you just stack it and then take it out one by one. So this means you can't access any part of the memory without the first rem uh, without first removing all that come before uh, the element you want to reach, but then you've already forgotten them. Uh, this kind of uh, allows us to build like a next level of expressive power that includes strings with simple nested patterns. As an example, a uh, previously mentioned string with equal A's and B's, uh, but also maybe um, balancing uh, parentheses. So when you write parentheses, it, it's good to have them as many opened and closed and in the right spots so that you don't like mess up your orders of operations. Um, but uh, what we see now that these nested patterns cannot be expressed in finite state machines, but they can in pushdown automata. However, uh, if we add just another layer of the nesting, then we're out of pushdown automata territory. For example, if we want an equal numbers of A's and B's and C's, this string uh, already poses an impossible problem for pushdown automata. Um, the same goes for balancing different types of parentheses. And for, for this already you need to build like a Turing machine. Here uh, the picture changes a bit more. Uh, the previous machines works on some input, but the input itself is left untouched. Uh, even if they could write down like one by one on simple memory. Uh, here the finite input comes on an infinite tape and then the rest is just empty. Um, and we can write on this infinite test tape uh, as much as we want and read at any point. Uh, so this control can move uh, to any direction on the tape at once. So we can access any memory at any time. Uh, and this then allows us to recognize extremely complex nested patterns and strings. And basically, this already means that it can recognize all the patterns any computer can. Uh, so, one reason to talk about this hierarchy uh, is that it's a clear example of building expressivity in a system. Uh, then you can think about each of the classes and the properties it has. Perhaps the most important result from thinking about Turing machines is the proof that the expressive class becomes mathematically undecidable. So this means that at this level, you can pose problems that are not solvable by any algorithm. Mm. So in the previous machines, uh, we would know for sure that whatever input we give them they will come to a decision whether to accept or not, but for Turing machines, there are no such guarantees. So what's different about this result in the history of expressivity episodes um, is that this one seems to bound expressive classes itself, not some particular set of rules of axioms. Remember, with Euclidean constructions, we saw that we, can, we can't make certain regular polygons with a straight edge and compass. But here the result seems to be that if you get to this level of expressive power by any means you want, you will always get undecidability. Um, this is perhaps the weirdest episode in the expressivity saga and maybe uh, is like the peak of <laughs> this lecture. So now let's go back and talk about philosophers. Um, so, they like to think about concepts and what they express about them is usually like a structure of relations or classifications. Uh, this is no different from what in the material world librarians and informatum, information scientists have, have to think about also. Uh, so, here are some examples of schemes of conceptuality. Um, so this is uh, Plato with, with his um, 
structure of relation between concepts that you get from a conversation in that's typical of this kind of dialogues he does. So it seems that if we complete this kind of structure, we will know what there is to know about concepts, or at least they will be sorted out and people won't get confused about meanings anymore. Um, so it's, it's kind of like a growing structure based on a conversation, I guess. So then Aristotle just gives us a bunch of categories that he abstracted from lang language and uh, now we get like a classification that's no longer clear how it would structure all the concepts just for every concept we know that it will be somewhere around here um, but if we would make this kind of diagram that Plato wanted it probably wouldn't be simple it would be recursive application of same categories and the thesis is that now these categories become a kind of limit of expressivity. So all possible thought is inside these categories. And so for Aristotle, this was like a given in language. And for Kant, uh, it worked in a similar way, just that now it is modeled on logic. It's simple logical relations uh, instead of things you get from natural language. Um, so it starts to show that the logical structure of thought might not be the same as the grammatical structure of natural language. Um, but all of these examples so far are classical in the sense that the underlying idea of what it means to be a concept is basically the same. Um, they're closely related to sorting, classifying, making categoric judgments. Uh, and this is why the infrastructures that they're linked with are like libraries um, where where we have classical problems of organization of knowledge. And the pragmatic issues uh, library orga organizations face are somehow related to these ideal conceptual structures that philosophers think about. Um, the practical issue of organization can lead to, of course, specific failure modes in libraries that might have analogs in philosophical theories of conceptuality. Um, so we can have books or other objects that don't fit in any available category, or we might accidentally create a category that are too wide and uh, has a risk of becoming meaningless. So in the Slovenian library system, the such a category is the social novel, which is at risk of becoming meaningless. Um, but already in libraries, we can see that uh, some books might fit into like more than one category or have multiple categorical characteristics. And information science developed various tools to deal with this kind of problems. But Interesting developments then pop up with prob probabilistic methods in classifications such as the base classifier, where a simple machine learning algorithm learns to classify objects based on probability it thinks that it belongs to one class or another. So a classic example for this is the uh, spam filter, where the classifier goes through the email and tries to decide if it's spam or not. Uh, on the one hand, this seems like an attempt to replicate categorical judgment, but it takes only a small leap in thinking to conceive of probabilities themselves as representing meaning. And infrastructurally, this can appear as meaningless content uh, or meaningless content organizations, such as we find in automated libraries and warehouses. So it's meaningless in the sense that there is no human readable navigation that would serve as a system for shelving uh, objects or books or whatever you're trying to organize. But the point is that the space here is not used as a shelf with a named category, but a representation of an optimal distance for the objects that perform the function of, for example, a warehouse. Uh, the warehouse itself is then not meaningless but it becomes itself a diagram of warehouse optimality, which is itself a reflection of consumer behavior. 
so the last move in this direction is the formalization of conceptuality as vector embeddings uh, that is a core component of current language models. Mm. So here the words and their meanings are embedded as vectors in a very high dimensional space and then these dimensions can be thought of to represent possible abstract relations. Um, in the illustration here we take 3D slices of some of these many dimensions and show that the idea uh, how the direction of the vectors is thought as a common abstract relation. So the next trick then is that these embeddings can be used for other objects to express different multidimensional relations such as similarity of images or whole documents which allow us to express different modes of searching and generating content. Uh, such generative models or, or vector databases uh, of text content such as the OECD library or that they use to like search for their numerous documents. Um, so this vector embedding is kind of the last formalism in my sequence. Uh, it is also gives a kind of direction for the expansion of possible formalisms. The embeddings themselves are hardly fully exhausted in terms of their expressivity, but it's unclear what sort of ideas are needed to make the most of it. Um, here I prepared some um, some examples of interfaces uh, that deal with embeddings. Um, huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, just pick one and I'll figure out which one it is. <laughs> yeah, so this is a, a color space explorer that helps you compare like a classical organization of colors to the way uh, in which they're embedded in the language model. So we're switching between um, <laughs> uh, like a spatial distributed, uh, spatially distributed colors in like an RBG space and then how they are represented in like a, a language model, this kind of high dimensional thing we we're talking about before. Uh, so maybe another one would be, yeah, um, is a kind of text optimization attempt based on parameters, which approaches text more like an image generator would, not like a chat that maybe is more familiar. Uh, so the last one was a kind of wacky interface for a kind of guy that autocomplete. Yeah. Yeah. So. So this is a kind of experimental interface for a guided autocomplete function. Um, but all of these are kind of, uh, I mean, it's hard to find a, a very good example, I think, to, to see that how, how would this help us with like um, extending expressivity with uh, this kind of models, even though they're obviously an uh, important step in this episodes that we were talking about. Um, so now maybe for the end, the question of meta explication is the question whether we can find a way to make the right or at least better explications based on such histories that we went through today. Because I guess it would be a shame if some good thing is just one idea or one formal tweak away from being expressible. Um, or if there is a way to know if some of them are forever inaccessible. Um, so yeah, I hope you find something useful in these episodes and uh, in this expressivity state of mind.